Uh, I've been in the networking business since 1978. Started out with military. I've had the luxury or not to see just about every technology uh, that's passed in that time. Worked on arcade things like Clipper Scatter, HF, Satellite, to Sonic Backbones. And I just uh, finished a project doing dense wave multiplexing where we're uh, multiplexing multiple ATMGs and Ethernet over light waves over a single piece of fiber. Um, so networking has done quite a bit of different things in that period of time. I've been in Cisco about four years now. Um, and what I'm doing at Cisco right now is I, I'm a consulting engineer for several states because of my background and touching a lot of technologies. Uh, I'm asked to focus on data voice and video integration, uh, which is a pretty big topic right now. Most of what we're going to talk about here today is, is video and voice. And the presentation is kind of broke up in three sections. Uh, it's a little bit about why it's happening now. Uh, there's terms called convergence, and depending whether you're technical or a user, they mean different things. We talk about some video and how it's used and things that need to be thought about. And then voice, I think it's left me. Voice being voice over technologies. There's voice over ATM, IP, frame relay out there. And then you hear terms like IP telephony, which is really uses voice over IP as a transport, but IP telephony is a lot more than just transporting voice. Um, so through this, ask any questions. You know, if there's if the first part of this, if you want me to move through real quickly, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to, to move through it and jump right into the video, right into the voice, wherever your interest slide. What's going on? We've had a lot of forms of communications. We use phones and personal communications for a long time, and along came email. Uh, the biggest thing is the web. And the web is something that's driving a lot of this integration discussion. And then there's video. Video kind of eludes that it's, that it's new, but video has actually been around for quite a while. Uh, most companies uh, did video conferencing using ISDN or some kind of dedicated facilities. To be, and the thrust was conferencing. Uh, remote meetings, we're all getting together instead of flying, we'll have a conference. Um, and there's a lot of talk that you know, it'll be on the desktop. You know, every desktop will be able to do conferencing with anybody. But we really haven't seen it take off. And there's probably several reasons for that that we'll talk about. Some changes have happened. Now, I don't know when it happened for this group, but according to these gentlemen, uh, 1998, email exceeded voice as a primary communications. For me personally, it happened about six, seven years ago that the phone became a secondary instrument for me, and email is much more important. Whereas I used to call somebody and follow up with email, now I email and send lots of information and then follow up with the telephone. Um, so when we talk about convergence, on the technical infrastructure side, it's usually thought of, of taking these services and putting on one infrastructure and converging it all. Um, but there's also a conversion happening from the user standpoint that's happening at the desktop. The way we do things is changing. And this is one of the indications. Some other things that are happening is that in the voice side of this, the traditional telephony world um, is at a point where there is a lot of old architecture out there. It is not readily adaptable to new architectures, a new way of doing business. And some of this architecture has been out for a long time, so from a cost standpoint, it's ready to change. All these new ways to communicate cause us grief as well as benefits. Um, 900 million voicemails a day, the email ones the one that gets me. That, that's, and that's not an email. Me personally, uh, across the street a little bit of park where I was actually on vacation uh, five days prior to this conference. I wasn't checking my email or voicemail or anything, so we had a hard time getting hold of me. But when I came back Friday morning, I logged on to the network and checked email. I received 600 plus emails from being off for five days. Now, 
probably half of those emails were just informational emails because of the Cisco systems architecture, the way we disseminate information, I can subscribe to aliases, I get pertinent information as it happens. So a lot of that I still need to look at, but they're not directly to me. But even if it's 150 emails that I need to respond to right away, that's pretty big. An awful lot of information. As a contrast, I had uh, 15 voice notes for five pages. So part of what we're going to talk about uh, is not just voice and video, but applications and things they enable that can help you with some of these challenges. So what we're seeing is in the new world, the user is becoming a focal point for all of these technologies. So no longer I just talk to somebody, I can talk to somebody that can provide me visual information. Uh, I can see pictures still moving. I can get data. So the benefit to this is everybody educating. You know, the more senses that you can involve someone in that you're teaching them something, the quicker they can pick up the concept and the reasons to explain. A lot of things are happening today of our technology. There's a lot of things in technology enabling today, but what I see more happening is that, that Technology is there, and some of it's been there for a while, but the users are really the ones that are driving this integration and this change. And another big segment is service providers. Um, these are the AT&T Sprints, but more some of the startups and ISPs that are trying to offer differentiated services. In the voice world, there's some ISPs that are trying to replace Centrex services with IP telephony. So having the traditional Centrex, but I put a layer three connection to the customer's premise that they use for internet connectivity and maybe for VPNs to get back to corporate to virtual private networks to tunnel through the internet. Um, I can just throw a bunch of phones on the facility as well and provide you phone service for that same connection. And they're doing that by that by convergence. They're putting voice, video, and data predominantly over ATM. Conversion goes into one infrastructure. So from an infrastructure standpoint, that's that's one version of convergence. And the other is conversion, like we talked about the email. Uh, but things changing at the desktop. Um, I've got some customers, big call centers. And you could have a call center for a retail environment or maybe here at schools for registration purposes and such. Um, the way information comes to the user is changing. So it's just not convergence to the network. There's applications out there. Anybody if you used a click to talk button on the web on the internet? Click to talk is starting to pop up on the internet now. And there's a couple versions of it. One is you click on a button when you have a problem on the website. It comes up and asks you for your name and phone number. You put that information in there and you send it off. It goes to a call center. That agent gets it and calls you back and says, Hi, well, come in, Greg. I see you at the Warner Brothers website and I help you. But that's all the information they have. They really don't know why I called or what my problem was. They just need to call me back. Now, this assumes you have a second line in your home, or you have a PC that's IP enabled for voice, and they actually make an IP phone call. The real talk, click the talk buttons, provide difference to the users. Um, it operates almost the same. You do a click to talk, you give them your phone number and your name. But there's a company called WebWise, some others who do this, lands in as a site that implements it this way. That information goes up into a call center. If you have an account at that location, and they can identify it by your, uh, your name, the web page you're at, maybe some login data, that information is pushed to the call in so they know who Greg Edwards is and you know what he's done at this place, been on my business before. At the same time, while that agent is calling me back, the web page that I was at comes up on that user's screen. So they know what web page I was at. So they know what I was looking at. They know who I am, what kind of customer I am potentially. So now when they say, oh, Greg, can I help you? It's usually, I see you're, you know, you're looking at you know, one of other statues and you have questions about something should be. It was bank. I see you're looking at blue mortgages. You have questions. So they know more about me. But they can also do one step farther. I say, well, I have a question about whatever. They say, well, that's located at this web page, and they can push that web page to me. So they can push information to me. So now they're helping me with my experience. So I've got voice, data, and video 
all part of this experience for folks that are trying to help you. And they do things like, if I have a form to fill out to get back to the, the banking environment as a mortgage payment, they can actually fill the form out for me by asking questions and push the completed form to me. And if I want to submit for a loan or an application, I click the submit button. If I don't, they can ask for a grant and store that form on my PC for me, which is the only time they can actually touch my machine. And then later I can pull that back up. So from a customer standpoint, there's a, a difference to the way we do things with the desktop. IP telephony, we're seeing that initially I'm taking a, a traditional phone and replacing it with, a, with an IP phone. And for all practical purposes, they're phone replacement. But the next step is that IP phones also are, are HTML or XML capable so that I can put web information in my phone. So what we're going to happen is that the phone is going to change from being a phone is going to be an internet appliance. Um, part of the integration is making sure we, in the voice world, legacy information uh, is protected and migrated. So in the voice world, I'm not going to come in here and say, we're going to do IP telephony and throw your, your affinity, who's affinity out? We need to migrate that. So the convergence, trying to build one network and leveraging the benefits of that, and there's going to be some pain to doing that. And then treating data, voice, and video as the services over that network would require certain things versus different networks. Why does it happen? I'll look at this real quick. But, uh, reduced cost comes up a lot. Putting video over a network is probably going to provide more cost reduction than putting voice over a network today. Um, voice is pretty cheap. You know, companies get voice for you know, less than three cents a minute on average nowadays. Um, the return on investment, boy, a voice over, full bypass technology may not show the return that it used to. It still needs to be looked at. I just went through a customer last year that uh, for six months I pushed on them. They said, we don't want to do, they're, they're doing voice over ATM. We don't want to do this. We get, we're less than three cents a minute. It's cheap. There's no sense looking at it. So I pushed for that period of time. They got quite upset with me, but they finally did a traffic analysis. And they found out how many minutes went between sites that already had a data network for them. Then they were even madder at me because I didn't push hard enough. Because what they found out in their instance is that they were doing about 1.8 million minutes a month over your contractor grade with your carrier between these facilities. So if they could put these minutes on the network, they would save $3,000 a day. So we did that. They're actually pushing about 2 million minutes a month over that network. In their environment, it took seven months to pay that back. So there still are cases where, in some instances, it's just voice full bypass is still viable. Video, depending on the type of video you do and how you do it, you know, the, the cost savings is don't have to travel. I can get information quicker. Um, you know, if you're, if you're discussing something and you need visual, it's a flying there, you can you know, set up a point to point video conference. For corporate communications or for learning, you know, I can have a learning class presented and the students could be anywhere. Um, so I don't have to bring them in and sort those costs. If you don't do the network right or you have a whole sport of types of video, they're going to cost the bandwidth and such to negate those. Um, we kind of talked some about new applications and growth, which I'll cover in a minute. And converging the network into a single infrastructure, for those who maintain networks, what you can do is take your, if you have video people, data people, and voice people, they basically can become, I don't know, anyway, mad at this, but sometimes voice and data people don't like this. They can become one organization leveraging their expertise to run this one network. Uh, I tell most of my customers is that when you converge this network, this doesn't mean that you're going to get rid of 40% or 30% of your people who are supporting those networks. The networks are continuing to grow. There's a shortage of people out there already. Converging applications. Uh, this is a big one here. Are you guys, are you guys familiar? Are you using the unified messaging? Do you like it? Uh, Probably one of the things he likes about it is that in today's world without unified messaging, if someone wants to get hold of me, it's their choice. 
do they call my office? Do they call my cell phone if they have it? Do they call my personal cell phone? Do they page me? Do they email me? Do they you know, call my house and ask my wife where I'm at? Uh, and not only that, the worst person possible sets the priority for whatever that message is, and that's the person calling me. You know, I support nine states. Every engineer that calls me, his message is urgent. He needs me to call him back right away. He says, it sounds very good, but you know what? They're not all urgent to me, but you know, they get queued up in the systems that way. So that's how it happens today. Unified messaging does a couple things. There's another piece to it that is called uh, intelligent assistance. The bundled together turn that whole model around to where I get one number out. And when someone calls me, the intelligent assistance looks at the calendar and decides what am I doing. I'm in a presentation. Don't call me. Don't, don't page me. Go to voicemail. And based on the user's second priority. If it's something very important, maybe it tries my office phone, my cell phones, and I don't answer, then it pays me and leaves me a voicemail. And not only that, is that when I go to retrieve that information, I don't have, you know, a phone, phone interface or voicemail, what's the problem with that? If I, if I have 35 messages when I go back and I'm really waiting for one, it's higher up, I gotta listen to every one of them. So I get to the one I want. Even if I message you, let me just jump right to it. Right now, there's applications, technology, things like DSPs, bigger, faster, better, Moore's Law. Um, probably the biggest thing is the internet. The internet has already proven that voice video and data integration works. I became a little at home. You know, I, I get email, I pull down movie clips, I make I get internet phone calls, I can pull video. Now, it's the best effort network. The quality is not quite what it should be. But the tools are there to make it. So what we're seeing is for, for businesses that are using home users over the internet, they're suffering with some quality issues. But if they're doing business to business with internet providers, they can get quality of service, which means I get certain guarantees that if I push video or voice over that business to business connection, I get the quality I need. And because of all these people who have been growing up with the internet are coming into the workforce now, they don't want to do things in a traditional way anymore. And they, they look at the internet and said, well, I could do this on the internet. You know, the quality wasn't that great. Now I'm in a place where I control the whole network, so you know, why can't I do the same thing as improve the quality? And then all this is happening. From the voice world, we're seeing a lot of pressure on in the voice world to get out of the proprietary and go into open standards, which helps make things move forward quickly. Today, if it's proprietary, in the voice world, it takes a lot to make change. If we look what's happened to the data world, we went from SNA, monolithic mainframes, green screen terminals, put PCs on desks, decentralized everything. It caused us some pain in managing it, but at the same time, standards allowed us more communications. It allowed end users to enable to do if the end user or small groups to do different things. So I've already covered this. What that? So we're back to you know all these things conversion on the user. Whether this is a customer, a student, they sitting at home. You know, can I do self help? Um, Cisco uses the web page, web the internet, both for support and for commerce. Um, most of our customers, probably eighty to ninety percent of them help themselves if they never talk to anybody when they do, we can pull all the technologies in place. That makes sense or do you have anybody disagree with any of that? I live in Dallas and I've talked to people from the hotel. I was surprised to see the reference to open standards. I don't follow all that, but I thought there was a problem that proprietary standards in the system network. There are there are very proprietary things in Cisco. Um, and somewhat of the difference is, is that in the data's environments, proprietary standards come out and those are submitted to standards bodies. Then a process is gone through to try and hash out a standard. Once the standard's in place, we adhere to the standards and we'll then work with other, stand, you know, other vendors that 
you know, follow that standard. And in all companies, there will always be something outside the standards as well. This is non-standard, but it's you can enhance your network by doing this. And it's a way to, to leverage your product and make the company look better potentially. Um, in the traditional voice world, they came up with proprietary standards and they're closed. They don't go to standards products. Who's they? Boosters, Nortels, Siemens, Roll. Um, you know, you use PCS protocols between two Lucent switches that's proprietary. That code is not given to anybody. It's not in the standards body. They have no intentions of doing that. If you go connect that to the public PSDN network, then they fall back to the standards. So there are standards. They fall back to the you know, PRI type interface. And you lose a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, but in a day world, the PC is pretty well not proprietary. You, you know, that Ethernet card would plug into anybody's switch. You know, I can plug somebody else's switch into my switches. I can plug somebody else's switches into my routers. So I can interwork that way. If I go into the voice world, Nortel phones plug into Nortel switches and nobody else's. Nortel's you know, voicemail system plugs into Nortel and nobody else's. I can't interwork. Uh, voicemail systems, unless it's like an octal, which is a little bit different creature. Um, so that world has been a lot more closed and a lot more proprietary over the years. Are we mostly interested in video in this group or voice? Video. So right now, this is being broadcast and taped, as I understand. So you do broadcast video, and then you're probably wanting to do something called video on demand. Um, we talk about video. There's a lot of video applications that are discussed. Um, E-learning, you know, doing online training, uh, distance learning, you know, corporate messages, uh, trying to get information out to individuals about company direction or you know, product or schedules. Uh, business meetings with kids into the conferencing. Um, and then there's just plain old multimedia applications. Um, so we talk about work, you know, living play on the internet and the way that that's done. Um, and then learning for the internet or just learning, period. But all these applications really, I was going to stick this. All these applications really fall into three types of video. There's broadcast video. Broadcast video, if your network is recording correctly, has the least impact on your network. Video on demand is very hard on infrastructure. And video conferencing is the worst. Broadcast video, either live or scheduled, in this case, there's a live, there's a live broadcast going out. Video camera is attached to a server that sort of captures that and pushes that information out. Um, and what it can do if the network's enabled right using things like IP multicast, it can look like a single stream. So if it's being broadcast out of this location and it's going you know, into Ohio to another location and there's 40 users there, I could potentially have one stream from here to Ohio then one stream to building A and building B, and then a whole bunch of streams at that last location. Um, so it's very efficient on the network. If I do video on demand, so broadcast is like TV. If I do video on demand, it's like watching a VCR tape. The user has pause, controls, fast forward, rewind, all that kind of good stuff. So what happens is that every user gets its own, it's a simple, single stream. So now if I have 40 users in Ohio that want to watch this and they're doing video on demand, that's 40 video streams that I have to push across the network. Video on demand can develop the network with And conferencing is the same thing, except now it's just not one directional video, it's two-way video because I have conferences going on. I don't have VCR light controls, but I've got unicast going one way and coming the other way, it's constant. So the broadcast that we're doing here, and it's live, it's going out. And then later, it could be sent out of the schedule. So this is a progression of use of this video process. Video on demand, you know, 
one-to-one unicast streams. Um, and what we're getting at is that the way it's implemented in a lot of companies is I do a live broadcast. It's pretty easy on my network. Um, after that, I schedule that repeat it several times so that I start to saturate the rest of my user group. And then lastly, I offer is video on demand. Because now my community should be down to just a few, so I should have hundreds of video streams. Um, so that's how those are used. Now, can I put those, can you put those over your current infrastructure? Uh, I've talked to a few individuals, and it sounds like maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, for the infrastructure guys, you know, do you have land switches everywhere, hubs or things in the past? Um, do you have land switches and routers that let you turn on quality of service? Quality of service is probably a buzzword we hear all the time. And really, what quality of service is, is basically taking a pipe and dividing it up among applications. If I have one run two video streams, two voice calls, and data, I turn on QoS tools to ensure that those can't get any more than two video streams on there and they each get X amount of bandwidth. They only get two voice calls on there, they get X amount of bandwidth. And then data gets everything that's left, but usually that's some number is guaranteed. So if everything is happening in the network at once. I have a minimum volume service that I know is going to happen for each of those applications. I know voice is going to get what it needs and it's going to sound good. The video is going to get through and look good. And I still get a certain amount of data to maintain whatever applications I'm running. That sounds very much like a TDM network. If anybody here has done any old TDM architectures, I think it's almost the same thing. The difference being is that when those two video streams drop off, data can grab all that bandwidth. The voice calls drop off. It can grab the data can grab that data. So what happens is you get data growing and shrinking. And you don't see that with the voice and video because those have some very stringent requirements. Um, there's a lot of talk that data networks you know, are unreliable and voices are very reliable. And when the voice over this network, I have problems with that. Um, that's a design process. And the other issue is that voice is unlike data. Voice is very stringent on delay. And a voice network high delay is a bad thing. Varying delay is worse. Um, in the data network, by loose data, I can retransmit. In the voice network, I could retransmit, but us as users won't like that. And you know, like we as the application could retransmit, and that means we're feeding ourselves. We don't like that either. So there's very stringent requirements when we put both of those over the network. Um, have you guys done video over the internet or attempted it here? How was your success? I found in a clinical program in Arkansas, and we have a mirror site. And what I've attempted is with uh, uh, CUC to see if I can set up with just people on the campus that are using circuit to see if we can get up to five conferences at one time in the multicast to see how close it would be, how workable it would be to do interviews, negotiations, administrative hearings, or mediation, that type of thing, uh, for the delivery of legal services. And actually, you know, as long as we left it self-contained, uh, we could you know, we could see each other and hear each other, but it was really, you know, people it's just like a real player on a bad day. I mean, people melt, you know, they dematerialize, when, you know, hopefully they reconstruct themselves before the session. Uh, you know, the lips move, and then later, you know, you get, you know, get what they were saying. Uh, so it wasn't anything that was going to be it was sort of promising, hopeful, you know. But uh, uh, with the bandwidth we had, and the equipment that we had, who knows, I can't testify to quality and uh, this was uh, actually this was probably a couple of years ago. Uh, it was not anything that we could use. It wasn't component from that way. Yeah. Now we, we have the press interactive video on campus and we do a lot of distance learning that way. And that, you know, with comments, 
and that that's very good, but it's just too expensive to use the water. And that's I mean that that's a very common scenario. <coughs> Implement something like that. It's you know it's more distracting than it's valuable. Uh, and and I've got some stuff that talks about design. Part of that problem is a lot of people do that. They take like a $69 camera, even a, a high quality camera, and throw it in a network, test it, it doesn't work, it gets banned. Um, the point is, is that video has to be designed from the network up. Um, another problem with, with that type of video I see to me is that um, in the past, you all remember the game Doom was you know, a terrible thing for data networks. They came up, actually, it's, it's more than a fad, it's, it's, it's still a big deal. If I got thrown on the data networks, and, you know, they just destroy data networks. Well, video is the doom of the day. Um, I have a lot of customers that uh, are using quality of service tools not to make sure video gets through the network, but to make sure that all video is denied through the network, period. <laughs> because, you know, one of them is a big university, and, uh, you know, they, they, they've gone through two major infrastructure upgrades. And every time we did, it wasn't, you know, it was like the next day the network was still saturated. So we said, we, we had other problems here. Well, you know, it's not about three games all over the net, there's video all over the net. And uh, both times they made their internet pipe much larger, and that just meant that the student, more students would pull more things down faster and still saturated the network. Um, and, so the design is important. And the picture up here is the broadcast and video on demand type architecture that um, is seen a lot. And some of the key things about doing this is there's one way to do it, and that is, um, you know, at a location, you know, have a, a content manager, which is basically just where I, you know, control content, what content I allow the network users to see, uh, when I let them to see it. Uh, how much of it I let go out of the, out of the network. Um, I have servers that are on demand or store uh, replay servers at this location. Out of this location, I could just have users out here and they could access the content manager and choose the content and request it across this network and get pulled from these servers. But this is expensive, right? Wide area bandwidth is not cheap. Uh, it's, and you get to pay for it over and over again. So a lot of networks, what we'll do is we'll put remote servers. And this works business to business. For the home user, there's a problem with this. You might not want to do this for this user. What happens is there's a thousand ways in the network that if out of this location, somebody starts pulling down a specific video, video on demand, several times. This infrastructure network can be smart enough to say, you know what? I've seen this so many times in this location. I'm going to pull the whole video down to this server and play it locally. Uh, there's also uh, something called cache engines that were originally used in, business, in businesses for the internet. Because so I had people going out and hitting the internet all the time. You know, I, I work for Cisco. I tend to go to the same pages a lot. So this cache director would sit on the site and pull these, this information and store it locally. So when I when someone else asked for it, it happened off that cache server, so it seemed like it was very fast. We're doing the same thing with video over the internet. So if people are pulling video down to their machines on the internet, these video cache servers can pull that whole video down and serve it locally. So what happens is those users think that that video is going locally, it's happening very fast. For that end user that sits at home, we're still relying on Things like a real player, Windows Media Player, there are software devices that um, pull down five seconds or 15 seconds or whatever a video and store it before you get playing it out. The problem with those implementations right now is that's all pretty, fairly dynamic versus letting you know IT people have control. So what happens is it decides to buffer 20 seconds of video and it's running great for a while, and all of a sudden there's congestion in the network. A 20 seconds of buffer isn't enough anymore. It's played out. Video melts. It's jerky, and then you know I try to catch up again. So 
there's still an issue with the home user doing things like video because there's no quality of service in the internet. It's just it's still best effort. Bandwidth is increasing every day. DSL cable and the end users are causing huge optical and ATM upgrades in the cloud. But in a business to business, you know, this is the kind of picture we see mostly. Video conferencing we talked about a little bit. You know, it was really originally done as um, I don't know how do you guys do it here. I know you do some video conferencing and this you was know, a carrier host. Called an MCU, and you call the carrier up, and you schedule a conference, and you send all that information to everybody, and everybody dials into the conference at a certain time to get the conference up and running. And that's a lot of administration. That's one of the things that's caused this not to be as popular. Is that, you know, what would be nicer for me as a user, if I could just log on to a server, set up my own conference, push that information out, and, and have my own control. Um, that would help. And then there's some other things that are just inherent video conferencing. Um, how big is the video conference? Most of my enterprise customers, they like conferencing when it's one-on-one. -on -one. You know, one small group to another small group. When I go from one group, or I have 15 groups involved, then it becomes an issue. Do I, how do I visually deal with this? I'm um, standing here and I know I'm conferencing 15 other people. Do I want to see all 15 people? So how big of a screen or how many TVs do I need to have to show 15 other remotes at the same time that are large enough that you know, I get some benefit out of it? I, I need to see their reactions as such. That, you know, if they're all real small and it's kind of grainy, then visually it provides no benefit. Um, now there's some technologies in place today that it's almost one-on-one. -on -one and most of the time I've seen this, it's working pretty good, but it's not foolproof. And that is that I have one screen, and when we're speaking, I see that image. If someone else speaks, or the network jumps from individual to individual. Uh, but there's problems with that. I mean, what happens when you get to real quiet? Some groups aren't quiet, and two or three people jump in and, and speak at the same time, and get, the system can't make up its mind who should be talking. So, that becomes an issue. In my environment, um, what I see is, is not so much conferencing with visual images, but it's voice conferencing with data collaboration, where I can share information. And I really need to see that in the visual. That's going to vary based on businesses. Um, if I'm talking to another engineer, I don't need to see a space. I can see the diagram and we can talk technically. Um, if I was negotiating with a salesman, I'd really want to see his face. Um, and I can find out you know, is he looks as serious one by the Conferencing over IP, I mean, it's basically it's the same thing from an application standpoint. Uh, it's just that instead of using ISDN or ATM to transport it, I put it inside IP. So all the application and user problems I have are still there. How do I display it? How do I switch? Um, but now you're running over your infrastructure, so now you have to deal with proper design, POS, those type of things to make sure the video is the quality and how much video you're going to allow. We all know this, right? The better, the better image I, I want, the more bandwidth I need. Most of the internet now, when you pull video, it's a little postage stamp because it's, it's not high bandwidth because it won't support it. Uh, but you can go watch it all the way up to 20 meg. I've got a customer that pushes uh, a 15 meg video stream between two cities all the time uh, in extremely high resolution. Probably the most important one to note is MPEG 4 up there if you haven't seen this yet. Um, these MPEG standards uh, are the video codecs. MPEG 4 is fairly new. MPEG 4 allows you to do very low bitrate video with extremely high quality. Uh, it used to be that you would use like this, like H.264 and 6420 k but the video quality was not that good. It was low band. MPEG 4 is a huge chunk of quality. For all kinds of images, or is it better? 
lossy frequently is better when you've got a lot of static dust. Uh, from what I've seen, it's overall images. The quality is against it, really. And when I talk about images, it's moving dynamic images. Um, static images. That's something else I didn't mention. A lot of uh, video conferencing now is being done with static images. And it's, an image pops up, and then 30 seconds later, an image pops up. You know, I guess I don't. I guess I don't see a whole lot of benefit because then, I, again, I've lost the real time visual. But it doesn't take much family. So when we talk about the network planning, we're interested. This might be broadcast. I can do something called IP multicast. IP multicast needs to be turned on on the whole network. IP multicast is something that's in the internet and it's in routers apparently uh, through all vendors. IP multicast is not in all LAN switches. It needs to be turned on in the entire infrastructure. If you don't turn IP multicast on in the LAN infrastructure, the video is treated as broadcast. So if I have a switch with 200 users on it, I have one person watching the video, and I don't have IP multicast on, that video is hitting all 200 ports. And all those machines that PCs sit on are having to deal with that coming in and making a decision whether to look at that video or not. If I turn on IP multicast, the switches communicate with the routers and find out exactly what port that video needs to go to, and they send it just to that port. And if you were to do this in a network, turn it on, you know, I've done this where I've seen all my switch ports are running 60-70% utilization. Turn on IP multicast, and you know, they all drop down to 2 percent except for the ones who are watching videos. And the process is there to do intelligent joins and leaves so that if I'm somebody else and I decide to watch that video, that it doesn't come all the way back from the head end, that switch sends a request to the local router and it pushes that video stream down to that point forward. First is video on demand being a unicast, like we said, one stream to everybody. So you can see what happens to the load on the networks I add users. And conferencing is unicast in both directions. Now, I would disagree with this chart a little bit about unicast being that much more of an impact. If you have a fully switched environment in your land that's all full duplex, wide area networks are full duplex by nature, then the impact won't be as much. But if you're not doing full duplex technology everywhere, um, then it will increase the bandwidth. Is, is, this, is this okay so far, or am I going too high or too low, or? Okay. Uh, so back to your point earlier, really to do introduce video in the network, you need to plan. If you're going to introduce voice into your network, it needs to be planned. Just throwing it on is probably going to fail unless you have an extremely underutilized network. And I see underutilization in campus environments a lot, but I never see underutilization over a lot of other people. Where you can turn on multicast, uh, you know, you're probably going to have to have bandwidth increases, again, unless you're, you're underutilized. Um, you know, these things are some of the QoS stuff to make sure the quality of service. Uh, one thing about quality of service, if you're building a video network, all the things you're going to do to enable video on that network, bandwidth, quality of service planning, those things will all apply to putting voice on the network. Vice versa, if you were to do voice first, all the things you plan to implement, design, apply to video, it just becomes a matter of I'm adding more bandwidth, more applications. So instead of a video, two video streams, it's two video streams, and it's voice, how much more bandwidth do I need to have? But you've already enabled all the POS infrastructure to do those. Um, IP and ATM. Um, for a long time, ATM has been that was the quality of service mechanism. ATM is prevalent in the wide area, and there was a big trust a long time ago that ATM would eventually go to the desktop. It would be one big ATM network. Um, if you needed faster than 10 megabit, you had to move to ATM because they didn't go any faster. So what happened, a lot of organizations have planned to do ATM, put infrastructure in, and what's happened to Ethernet. 
Ethernet has gone from being 10 megabit to 100 megabit to gig, all over copper. There's even some discussions going on right now. They think they're going to get 10 gig over copper. Um, so, you know, I remember the modem days when people said all 9.6 modems were going faster. Then 192 came out. Nobody believed it. And now we're doing DSL or the same copper at multi-megabit speeds. So I don't know where that speed is going to end. Uh, what I've seen happen is that in a lot of places that put ATM in the campus and ATM in the land, they're in the process of replacing ATM in the campus. They're leaving ATM in the land uh, because it has strong benefits there, and those are high-speed services off across the carrier. You know, so a few places in the country that are actually offering Ethernet from your premise to the carrier. Um, it's a technology called Datamon, very short distances. But that's the only high-speed access to the cloud. Uh, the reason that they're putting IP into the campus is, one, it's going faster and cheaper than what ATM costs for. We've never seen ATM really make it to the desktop. Uh, ATM deck vendors, um, there's less and less of those. Uh, the promise of ATM with the class of service, the quality of service, really was going to come from something called switch virtual circuits. So from an in-station, I can signal a call, get a quality of service guarantee, make that call from the network. Well, if the in-stations aren't becoming ATM aware, I can't do that. If you look at development, everything right now is focused on IP. So my in-stations are IP aware. So the video and voice and data I classify my IP traffic. So that's part of the reason that's happening in campus. And quality of service with IP gives me a lot of granularity. It's down to the individual photos and the applications. Uh, when I get to the wide area, I don't need as much granularity because I can get ATM services and put a lot of information into those different ATM pipes to guarantee delay bandwidth through the wide area. And it's basically my only wide area service that goes to the speed like that. Um, for quality of service, um, you know, this, this alludes that you know you need to really be cautious with points of congestion, but you really need to be deployed everywhere in the network. Because what's a congestion point today probably be a congestion point for a while. What's not a congestion point will probably become one at some time. Much of you did deal with QoS, like you know, RCP and IP presidents and all this stuff up here means. Anybody? Okay. Who would have really been really smart? <laughs> uh, these are just some of the terms. There are ways to guarantee service to the network. RCP works for video, and this works for voice today. And that is an end-to-end -end technology that an in-station can say, I'm going to make a video call. I need this much delay, this much bandwidth. All the network infrastructure in place must understand this RCP technology because it will be asked through everybody to make a connection. If everybody can grant the bandwidth and the delay requirements that connections made, they guarantee quality video. It doesn't work with voice right now because what happens today with voice is RCP starts its request the voice connection gets made, and you start talking about the time the RSVP comes back and says, oh, not that bandwidth, but the call is there, so you can't hang it up. That's being fixed right now. IP precedence is, from IP or layer 3 point of view, is a way to color IP packets um, so they can be identified as they traverse the network and how important they are. Uh, IP telephony or voice. Um, you read documents, you'll probably see it classified as IP precedence 5, or 0 through 7. And then there's other terms called cost, uh, type of service, to bring our expanded capabilities. Um, smart scheduling, queuing, this talks about these are things that, you know, from my network, how do I get stuff out of my box? Who's important, who's not? Uh, how important are they? Traffic shaping. Uh, in networks today, uh, I have a lot of customers that bring DS3s in their facility. These DS3s are clocked at 45 megabit. They may only be buying 10 megabit of bandwidth. Um, 
So what happens is the router makes a consent of 45 meg. It's up to what's called a clock rate. The SKU gets out that fast. Um, if I have a lot of information, I need to send it out. And I clock it out at this 45 megabit. And it's going to this site over here that's a T1. You know, I've got a big fire hose. I'm shooting into a bucket. I'm trying to get it out of a little hole on the other end. Water's going to go all over the place. Right? So traffic shaping is a way to make sure that you know, that big pipe, that I, I funnel it down so that as fast as I push traffic out the other side to get it out of the network. So it's a way of protecting my traffic so I'm not throwing it away in the network. Data, like I said, data has been made that it can't have stuff thrown away. Um, voice to video can. Video is a little more powerful. The voice is not. Voice. Uh, traditional telephony, you know, users, PBXs connected to the PSTN. Uh, I may have another site that has PBX and users, I'm connected to the PSTN. And now I can call, we can call each other, we can call in the same location across the network. Uh, in this environment, there's something called multiple connections, one session each. So for every connection I have to this switch, I can have one phone, one voice call going on. Uh, the data networks live in a different world. Uh, I have key systems out there I may not have connected. And the step that we did is we took and connected the T1s between these PBXs and we could bypass the public network to save ourselves some cold costs. So there's two things about voice in the world today. You heard of voiceover technologies, which is voiceover frame, ATM, IP, or full bypass technologies, which are taking advantage of I have a traditional data network in place. These networks have come up in parallel. And where a small key system site from a voice standpoint, I may not have connected it to my larger voice infrastructure. I have connected data into the larger infrastructure. So if I have a data network in place, uh, this network that has one connection, so this is a single connection that had multiple sessions going on, so the apparent differences in the network. Uh, I'm going through this fast. You guys are all going to be. Uh, so there's been a migration progress process that if I want to do full bypass, I can put a card in these routers and connect them to a traditional interface on PBX and compress that voice traffic that would normally take 64K of bandwidth. They have to compress it down to 8K and maintain the same quality and push it across my data network that allows me to get rid of that connection. So I may have saved myself some money or I may not have saved myself money because I had to upgrade the data network to handle this additional traffic. But it goes back that those voice calls aren't there. Um, that bandwidth can be used for other applications. The other point of IP, is of IP is. Oh, we're nearly out of time. I wonder if you're going to take any questions at the end or. Okay. Why don't I just do that now? <laughs> I have a question about the use of satellites and satellite dishes and uh, data transfer. Um, I have a 15 inch satellite dish at home that I use for receiving a television broadcast. It appears to me that that would be a good way to receive information from the web. Do uh, you have any views on whether um, they're going to do it? Satellite vendors now that provide that service. Um, and it's similar to a DS to a, what's called a asymmetrical DSL service where I get high speed downlinks. My uplinks are fairly slow. Uh, for, for web stuff, for, you know, for data and downloading stuff, that's a great service. Uh, it offers some problems for video and voice because of the asymmetrical nature. And I've got to make sure that I'm not, you know, the voice needs the same amount of bandwidth in both directions for all practicality. So um, i got to make sure that I'm not doing things with my uplink that are going uh, and there's delay issues. I did some work with NASA and uh, we tested voice over uh, circuits that we had delay over 2,500 milliseconds, which is extreme. Um, voice quality was pretty good, but the application of the end user us hated it. 
if you ever talk over a satellite phone, um, it's like, hello? Hello. And we're not accustomed to that. Right? So what do you do? You know, you say, hello? Hello. And you step on each other. It's like, you know, it's just the idea. You know, like, keep backing off until you get it right. Um, so the high delay, you, you can deal with it if you want to look it into uh, if you have variable delay in your network, that will destroy the voice quality of the camera. Uh, for schools that uh, are moving in there too, uh, tell, tell me a little bit, it looks to me like a different thing for it. And the speed that I've seen between it, I mean, what, those that, that have uh, some connection in there too, but they still have got you know, a water hose leaving a fire hose and that kind of thing. I know it's not given a response time, but and I don't know what the vocal is with that, but someone's talking like seven. But it looks to me like there's going to be increased capability how far that takes us. I don't know. And, and also, it seemed to me that uh, Internet 2 had additional process because at least some limitation that we were trained to educational uh, institutions at least for time so that usage uh, would be contained a little bit uh, better than you know, so what you're seeing is you're seeing the next generation of much higher bandwidth. And that's a big deal uh, because it is there's more amounts of information being pulled down. Uh, bandwidth doesn't solve all the problems, right? Uh, contrary to a lot of beliefs, but what you're seeing a lot of the internet stuff is they're putting in newer generation hardware that you know, allows them to do some of the quality of service items. So that, they have the ability to begin to differentiate between data types and guarantee certain amounts of bandwidth for those data types. Have you, have you had occasion to look at uh, we've got most user interactive video conferencing on the internet too to see the quality of the video and the audio there? I haven't got to see it here. Um, Cisco does an awful lot of distance learning over our network. And, uh, some of it we push over satellite, most of it over infrastructure. But it's not interactive. It's broadcast live or scheduled, and uh, it's data feedback back up to the presenters. So I can write a question and send it up to an administrator with that presenter. Right. It will break it in. Right. right. That way he can say, well, I don't answer that question. <laughs> well, this, this is a good question. Uh, because they're trying to struggle with how do I present, you know, the thing is, is that if I can do distance learning, I might not contain myself to 30 or 60 students. You know, what if I have 150 students watching that? How do I present that back to the instructor? Thank you.